The content herein is for informational purposes only, not intended as medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, and is not to be substituted for direct advice from your doctor. Today's LymphCast program is proudly sponsored by Vita Support MD, the makers of Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000. These MPFF-based nutraceuticals are backed by science and recommended by doctors specializing in venous and lymphatic disorders. Visit VitaSupportMD.com to learn more. Welcome to LymphCast, the show that brings together doctors, other health professionals, and special guests to discuss lymphedema, venous disease, and other associated disorders, and what can be done if this is affecting your life. Now it's time to sit back, relax, as it's time to learn all about lymphedema, venous disease, and associated disorders on our show, LymphCast. Greetings and welcome to our LymphCast show. Whether you're watching it on video or listening strictly on audio, we're glad you're with us for episode number 20. How about that? Let's uh, meet the man who started the whole thing, a physician surgeon from New Jersey, but also the founder and owner of Vita Support MD, makers of Vein Formula 1000, Lymphatic Formula 1000, Dr. John A. Chuback. Greetings, Dr. Chuback. How are you, sir? Hi, Paul. We're doing well today. A little cold and stormy here in northern New Jersey, but... Uh hanging in there a little envious of those of you in Florida but uh, <laughs> we're, we're doing we're doing great and really really excited about today's guest and learning more about learn uh, Vita support MD as you know uh, or you may know is a is a supporter of learn and we and we work with them hand in hand and hope to continue to build that relationship going forward so I'm really excited about today's discussion and uh, and today's guest thank you very much. All right, and uh, from New York, uh, RVT, I believe, are the initials uh, after her name, uh, Jacqueline S uh, Sasek. Uh, greetings, uh, Ms. Sasek. How are you? Hi, Paul. I'm doing well. Thank you. All right. Glad to have you here. Uh, from California, Dr. Emily Eicher. Greetings, Dr. Eicher. How are you today? Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for asking. All is well and cold in California. All right. <laughs> now, would you take the honors of uh, bringing in our special guest, and then we'll get going. It is really an honor to uh, announce our wonderful William Ripici, who is in charge of Lymphatic Education and the Research Network. He has many titles and achieved so much in a uh, little over a decade. And I know I have the honor of knowing him ever since the beginning of the Lymphatic Education and Research Network. Prior to this, it was Lymphatic Education Foundation. And uh, once uh, Bill took over, it completely changed the face of lymphedema, not only nationally, but internationally. And we are dedicating today a special day for March 6th, which is the Lymph, lymph Education, Lymph World education of lymphedema all over the world and thank you thank you bill for doing this plus you can start giving us all what you achieved in such a short period of time thank you thank you very much it's wonderful to be here uh, emily and i have had a love affair since we first uh, we first met and started talking about all this and some incredible things have happened as a result of uh, that friendship uh, that we've had and that mentorship uh, from from Emily. So I look forward to talking about that a little bit as we go through, but I'll, I'll turn it back to you to uh, start off whatever questions of where you'd like me to begin. All right. Who would like uh, to begin the questioning? Uh, take, take over from there. Well, if it's okay, I'll ask the first question. <clears throat> um, we have nothing prepared. So these are really all sincere questions and a sincere conversation uh, that comes from the heart for all of our listeners to, to know that. Uh, Bill, I've looked a little bit at your CV and your background. Share with us how you first um, came to uh, take your uh, very, very important role at LEARN. Uh, yeah, well, my role at LEARN was a, a complete total accident, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, my background uh, as a, a psychologist, uh, my doctoral work that I'd done was in behavioral disabilities, but I ended up 
uh, before I would finish the dissertation, they said, would you mind going to Alaska? There's an organization that went bankrupt for the development of the disabled, and it's the only one of its kind in the interior northern part of Alaska. Could you go and just pretend to be a CEO uh, for a couple of months? We're going to write a program for them. Well, the university never wrote a program, and I found once I got there, uh, it was such a fertile environment where so much had to be done that I'd never done before. I never had to supervise the staff. I never had to lobby before. I never had to do budgets. Uh, programming, yes, that I was focused on. Uh, after a couple of months, the board asked me if I would stay and become the CEO. I thought that was rather strange because they were interviewing all these uh, gray-haired men from all over the country and <laughs> to be in that role. Uh, but I ended up taking it and spent nine years uh, in, in Alaska uh, doing that. Uh, that led to a career in theater afterwards when I picked up a play written by a man with cerebral palsy. Uh, that was a real diatribe against the way the whole human service system worked. And I was able to use the play both in Alaska and around the country as a vehicle to move away from institutional models to deinstitutional models and community-based programming uh, for people who are disabled. Uh, and then after 18 years of producing theater, because I came back to New York and just did that, uh, I knew it was kind of over. And I went back to Africa where I taught school for a few years, many years ago, and spent a year working uh, in a vaccine program for pregnant women and children in the bush of, uh, of northern Kenya. When I got back, uh, I had to reinvent myself. And I thought, I'd like to stay connected with Kenya. So the diseases I was used to working with there, malaria, tuberculosis, AIDS, et cetera. And I saw the job announcement for the Lymphatic Research uh, uh, Foundation, which said international uh, organization uh, in major health issues. That was it. They didn't even say the name of the organization. So I applied and I went in for the interview and then they said, oh, well, actually this is about lymphatics. And I said, okay, I, I don't know anything about lymphatics. And they said, well, lymphedema. I said, well, great. You don't have me there either. They ended up offering me the job and actually I turned it down. Uh, because at the time I was actually up for a job as uh, director of the Jazz Museum of Harlem. Talk about being, you know, off kilter here, but in any case, but one thing was very curious to me, and that is after they offered the job, I went out and started talking to friends of mine. And one of the first people I talked to was uh, uh, somebody I went to college with, and she is uh, the dean of, uh, at Fordham Law School. And I said, you know, they offered me this job. It's about lymphatics. And she said, I've never heard of it. I said, yeah, uh, this disease lymphedema. She said, no, no idea what that is. I described it. And she said, oh, my mother has that. My mother had breast cancer. Her arm is like this. She has to rep. There's a name for it. Other people have this. I thought, hmm, this is curious. Brilliant person. Mother has it. Never heard of it. I was at a doctor's house, relative of mine, a week or so later. Same conversation. No idea what I'm talking about. My relative put her leg up on the kitchen table and said, whatever you're talking about, I've had it since I was a girl. Other people have this? There's a name for it? My doctor says it's called drainage issues. I thought, wow, drainage issues. Now, there, there's something for you to look up in, <laughs> on Google to get advice. So I became curious, and I went over to the MS Society. Because one of the things that they said at this organization that I applied for is they said, either you take this job or we're going bankrupt. We have very little money left, and we're afraid we're just not going to survive. Well, when I realized there were up to 10 million people in the country that have lymphedema, I thought, all right, multiple sclerosis. There are about four to 500,000 people in the United States with this disease but they have about a $280 million a year budget. Well, this organization that has 10 million people with lymphedema alone, let alone all the other lymphatic diseases, is bankrupt. Uh, I went over and talked to the MS Society and they did say, one thing you would say with us is there isn't a person in the United States with MS who is not a member of the MS Society. And our funding comes from patients and their extended networks and the events we do that they are involved in. Every message has to be a message of hope and has to include the patient population. So I ended up going back to this organization after I had already turned the job down and said, just some advice that you may want to take or may not. But I would suggest you may want to consider rebranding your organization. 
It was called Lymphatic Research Foundation. They focused very much on researchers. My sense was researchers don't want to give you money. Researchers want you to give them money. So you're not going to support yourself using that particular model. Uh, but expanding to more of an advocacy education base at this point would allow you to bring in the population of those people with the disease where you're more likely to be able to fund your programs. The response to that was, if we did that, would you be willing to accept the job? And that I found interesting. So I said yes. And what they did is they had about $150,000 left in the bank. And I said, if I take the job, I'm going to take all of that and hire this company in San Francisco, a citizen group, to rebrand the organization. And they said, go for it. We did. Uh, we became the Lymphatic Education and Research Network. Uh, that also entailed doing an entirely new website. Uh, these were the days, uh, really, the organization grew, um, you know, on the backs of the people who found it with very little money, using the talents they had to get people who would do things for, for free or for not very much money. So we had a website at the time that was about three inches wide, and it never changed because the guy who did it, everybody was afraid to ask him to do anything because he wasn't getting paid. So it was pretty static. Uh, instead, now we had a gorgeous website full of information, and we were able to expand our programming in the education as well as uh, in the advocacy uh, uh, realm. I, I really felt my biggest job at that point was, since they had already felt they had reached you know, rock bottom, was, all right, I'm interested in the curiosity of how do you take 10 million people and make them invisible? When I looked up and saw there were about a million people in the country with Parkinson's disease, about 330,000 people with AIDS, about 1.2 million that are HIV positive, only 15 to 30,000 with ALS, all these diseases that everybody knows on the street would know something about. And yet I'm talking to people with lymphedema and they have no idea what I'm talking about. Now, this was a mystery that had me fascinated. For somebody who loves putting puzzles together, pulling back the onion to figure out how do you take 10 million people and make them invisible? And how do you make those who know they have the disease feel that it is so insignificant that they should even be embarrassed about talking about it? Because what their surgeons have told them is, yes, you have lymphedema. I cured you from cancer. This won't kill you. Find a therapist. Don't complain. And I would hear that same phrase so often that I was sure they taught these people this in medical school because it was just the, the phrase that I would hear over and over again. So this last 11 years for me now, really was very much the peeling back of the onion of figuring out what caused this, because what I've learned is tragedies don't happen because one thing goes wrong. Tragedies happen because a multitude of things go wrong and they all conspire with one another to create a tragedy. And it makes it much harder to unravel it uh, as a result. So that became the journey that uh, I, I kind of took on when I uh, joined Learn. That was a very long, long-winded answer to your it's question, a, but uh, it's that, a, it's that's not where it started. A, uh, Bill, it's, a, it's an incredible answer, and I got to cut in and go to my dear friend for more than a dozen years, Jacqueline Sasek, who ran my uh, vascular lab uh, very, very successfully for many years. Jackie, how much do you love Bill Rapici already? I mean, I know amazing, John, right? amazingly. Amazing, right? Amazing. Amazing. I mean, what part of that story isn't incredible? Yeah. Right. But we we used to talk about this all the time, not not only with forget about lymphatic. Lymphatic is really invisible, but even venous disease, the understanding of venous disease, Jackie being an expert, expert sonographer. We just couldn't believe the number of people coming in with really, really sick legs from venous disease who had never been told they have a disease, never been told what the diagnosis is. And as you said, a lot of shame, a lot of hiding. Um, and then, of course, in more recent times, we've all come to understand the close relationship between venous and lymphatic disease and flebo lymphedema and that all edema in venous disease is lymph lymphedema and so on and so forth. So in that regard, when when Bill talks about 10 million people with lymphedema, I mean, that's a super duper duper conservative, conservative number. Amazing, amazing journey. Jackie, I saw you writing something. Was there something you were gonna ask Bill? 
Well, I'm curious how how did 10 million people become invisible? What's great, great question, right? What did yeah, you find inside that um, onion? Bill? What, yeah, what yeah, yeah. As I started peeling back the onion, I mean, certainly some of the things that started off is because the lymphatic system isn't very easy to see. Uh, you needed to get to the point of the magnification where you actually could begin seeing exactly how the lymphatic. So I think the science needed to catch up and the technology needed to catch up to a point. Uh, I think because there weren't technologies of how to deal with lymphedema necessarily from a medical point of view, medical schools didn't teach anything about it. So you ended up with doctors who knew nothing about lymphedema, so they couldn't diagnose it. So patients didn't walk away knowing the name of the disease they have. You can't develop an advocacy group of people who don't even know the name of the disease that they do have. So suddenly it does all become invisible. My guess is if in fact there are up to 10 million people in this country with lymphedema, I wouldn't be surprised if the majority of those people don't know actually what the name of their disease or have it. More and more uh, you know, are learning about it as we move forward. But I find as well, one of the dilemmas with, with doctors is, um, you know, if you're gonna be a physician, you, you, you need a little bit of a God complex, I have to admit. You know, I've had a couple of you know, uh, uh, surgeries on shoulder, whatever. I, I want you to be God if you're gonna cut me open. The, the other issue with that though, is if God comes across something they can't fix, you got a dilemma. Either this doesn't really need fixing and it's not that important or I'm not God. Well, let me think about that. Let's go door number two. It's not that important. And so I think it's been easier for surgeons to rely especially on the idea that uh, I cured your cancer uh, this isn't that important. The problem is if you talk to people who have lymphedema, they will say lymphedema is worse than cancer. They cured my cancer. Lymphedema is forever. And it affects every waking moment of my life. My spouse doesn't want to have relations with me anymore. I can't wear clothes anymore. I don't look fashionable. People mock me on the street. I'm getting cellulitis a few times a year. I'm in pain. Uh, I have to get these garments and the insurance doesn't cover, et cetera. Uh, it's, it's extremely devastating for people. And that's what I obviously hear is this story all the time. The next trick though became, how do you take a population of people that have been so beaten down and make them self advocates? And I found that became a challenge because very often we would try to get people to become advocates and the response I would get is, stop asking me, Bill, that's your job. I said, my job, I don't have lymphedema. I'm just here to support you. If it isn't that important to you, there's not much I can do. I need you to make phone calls. I need you to lobby in Washington, DC. And I need you to contribute to this organization. Um, as I said, this organization, even still, we have a budget of, you know, uh, without the CDC grant, which we've got recently, about a, a million dollar a year budget. The MS Society has a $300 million a year budget. Uh, I would love to have 70 or $80 million a year to give out in research grants the way they do. However, uh, we've attempted to be clever in the way that we've approached the way we spend our money. And one of the things that has been enormously successful uh, at this point have been the three big groups that traditionally ignored our disease altogether, the CDC, NIH, and the Department of Defense uh, Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. So they all became targets uh, because they could pump resources into our effort and our community in ways that our organization looking at funding for people who give us five dollars a month uh, to become a, a member was never going to provide uh, and so I, I don't know if i should go into what those other those three agendas are at this point but they've all come together this year and they are all major uh, uh agendas that are going to define this next generation of uh, lymphatic research and lymphatic treatment. Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000 from Vita Support MD are backed by science and sold in doctor's offices. If you're a physician who may be interested in prescribing or selling these excellent nutraceuticals, please call 862-246-7877 to speak to a representative today. Well, before you go into those three agendas, Bill. I want to ask when you were looking for people, I'm going to take a shot, I'm going to take a stab in the dark here, but when you were looking for people to work with you and champion the cause and be an advocate, how did my colleague and friend, Dr. Eicher, uh, fare in that 
in that regard? Um, I, I normally don't get too mystical about things, but uh, this was a, a, a match made in the heavens. And uh, I, I have to admit, it is the probably leads to one of the more bizarre things that I've ever been involved in. Uh, I had seen an article in Coping uh, with Cancer magazine uh, about Kathy Bates. And it was an article really ostensibly just about her cancer. But at one point in the article, they mentioned that she also has lymphedema and Dr. Emily Eicher is her doctor. I didn't know Emily at that point, but I did notice that she was actually in Learn's database. So I reached out to her and it turned out both of us were attending a conference uh, shortly after. So we uh, made a date to, to meet and uh, have breakfast uh, at the conference. Uh, we, we kind of fell in love with each other right away as we talked about our uh, agendas, our desires, et cetera. And Emily said, I'm going to introduce you to Kathy Bates. This was phenomenal. If there's one thing that certainly benefits a, uh, a disease or cause, especially one that's as invisible as ours, it's having a recognizable person actually speaking to it. And that's something we had never had before. Uh, I was in touch with Kathy. We knew a lot of the same people because I'd spent 18 years producing theater in New York. Uh, that said, we met at a hotel here in uh, New York City. We spoke for a few hours. At the end of the meeting, Kathy said, stood up and said, well, Bill, this has been very interesting. I really appreciate it, but I'm not ready to be uh, a spokesperson. My cancer is too new. The lymphedema is too new. I'm afraid it's going to end my career. Emotionally, it's terrifying. I'm simply not ready to do this. But I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. I have to go now uh, because I have to do a TV show. And I said, what, uh, what TV show are you doing? And she said, Andy Cohen's uh, Watch What Happens on Bravo. And I said, Andy lives upstairs from me. I ran into Andy in the elevator yesterday, and I asked him if he'd be the first member of Lauren's honorary board. And Andy said, you know, sure, Bill, whatever I can do to help. And Kathy just stared at me and said, that's the sign. That's the sign. I was meant to be learned spokesperson. And that was it. She jumped in full throttle. We went from a hard no, I'm out the door, to I was meant to be learned spokesperson. And she has been with us every step of the way, giving speeches, speaking at conferences, meeting with the CDC, meeting with NIH, meeting with untold number of congressmen, uh, congresswomen, and senators. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I just give her an, an incredible amount of credit. The other thing that was actually brilliant, Emily, about, of all people, bringing Kathy to us, uh, certainly I'd worked with a lot of celebrities, and when it comes to events, uh, the idea of a celebrity just showing up, walking in the front door, walking out the back door, not really being that informed about the disease would be pretty typical. Not Kathy. Kathy really dug in. She wanted to know the talking points. She wanted to study what the issues were. She wanted to be involved in writing her own speeches, et cetera. Uh, and she's also a very forceful personality. So when we're meeting with the CDC, Cancer, Cancer Prevention, and saying, why don't you have anything about lymphedema on your website? And they say, that's because we focus on infectious diseases. Kathy's there to say, what are you talking about? Cancer isn't an infectious disease. You have all kinds of websites about this. And then the director turned to me and said, Bill, why don't we work together and create a website about secondary lymphedema for the website? So um, very bright woman, very passionate woman, and uh, someone who was invested in talking with the patients on a regular basis, knowing their stories, consoling them with their stories, remembering those and reaching out to them and making friendships with them going forward. She's uh, an extraordinary person. And all of that happens for one reason and one reason only, Emily Eicher. And then Emily would have the walk in California every year. We would have a reception. So Billy Bob Thornton and uh, uh, Sandra or, or uh, um, well, and many other celebrities, Angela Bassett, uh, Sarah Paulson, et cetera, all would come to this. And you may think, oh, big deal. So you're having celebrities at an event. No, what was so touching to me is the first time we had it, I remember two women entering the room and they turned to each other and said, look who's here. Look who's paying attention. 
We're not alone anymore. We're not invisible. We will never be invisible again. Powerful. So the message that celebrities were able to impart on a patient population who felt they were so ignored, but no more. And they had become very fierce at this point at advocating for the changes that are now occurring, which I think over the course of the next several years are gonna be monumental in nature. Yeah. I said, I would love to roll the biggest red carpet for Bill, because again, as he started from nothing, now we have NIH paying attention to the word lymphedema. And uh, as everybody knows, why I am not in surgery, but in this lymphatic disorder community is because I developed lymphedema. And that was during my surgical residency. And at that time, in early 80s, nobody knew even how to spell the word lymphedema. And on my personal level, yes, they did uh, all venous, ven venogram and angiogram, and nobody paid attention to lymphatic disorders. And especially with the history of lymphoma, the first thing is, well, let's check the lymphatics. Now we made a gigantic leap in research and education and big part of it is Bill, because Bill opened up the doors and knocked the walls down to the awareness. And we have awareness, even the other day I got a note from India. So it's not only here that Bill introduced these people uh, with lymphatic disorders in the United States. They are all over the world and everybody knows Bill and it was his work. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Bill. Yeah, I'm going to uh, just, just soften some of the adulation. I mean, it's, it's, it's great that we have these great feelings for one another. Uh, I mean, I come in on the foundation of, of what uh, the Lymphatic Research Foundation before me had, had all uh, set up. And certainly with Dr. Roxon as well, who continues to this day. I mean, I'm in touch with uh, Stan on a daily basis uh, about issues. Uh, they, they were ready for uh, a transition up for sure. And they were very ambitious. It was them who hired me and took the chance uh, uh, that they did. Uh, for me, I didn't know anything about lymphatics, but I'm pretty good at puzzles. And that is figuring out who are all the players out there that need to be put together to be able to move this forward and then developing relationships with all those people. So hopefully they trust you well enough that they're willing to work with you in actually making that happen. Uh, I think the thing that really endeared me to this field, when I went to the very first Gordon Research Conference, it was as if there were these bunch, of, these bunch of explorers who discovered an island that nobody had ever landed on before that was just full of riches. They were so excited about it. There was no fame. There was no fortune. There was no money in it for any of these people. Nobody they talked to knew anything about what they were doing except for the small group, but they were so fascinated with it. This was a, a very different kind of environment then years later, when I would be talking to a group of vascular surgeons who would say, Bill, you keep trying to teach us about lymphedema. Why should I care? You give us nothing to do. So a patient comes in, I say, you have lymphedema, go find a therapist. How do I make a living? That's one appointment. Different, different way of looking at the situation. How could you not love these guys and these, these, these people that just were so dedicated to just finding answers to this question that was just beginning to be discovered. And then of course, in tune with all these people that are suffering just you know, terribly uh, around the world with this disease, but not only being ignored, the idea that, I mean, here we are 2023, there isn't a single drug to regulate the lymphatic system, really? All the drugs we have for the cardiovascular system, not one when it comes to the lymphatic system. Uh, so obviously, you know, very, very long ways uh, uh, to go. And it's just, it's been my honor. I mean, it's just like these brilliant people in this field. Uh, but bringing them all in, I mean, it's not only Kathy Bates, Steve Gutenberg, another actor, his mom, I was just talking to her on the phone the other day. Uh, Steve's been absolutely brilliant as well. Uh, Wendy Williams has helped out also uh, very much. Wendy has uh, lymphedema uh, in her foot, again, giving uh, uh, another face uh, to this disease. But uh, uh, people that live with this disease, the people who've created chapters uh, all over the world. Uh, I mean, certainly the establishment of World Lymphedema Day 
which really was helped along by uh, you know the patient community. Uh, basically, I began to see that whereas we had the Awareness Day here in the United States, let me do my Awareness Day, I began to see other countries were developing their own Awareness Days on different days, some in different months. And I thought, this, this isn't good. Uh, you, you, you don't want this broken up in this kind of a way. And I remember talking to a, a, a guy who has uh, lymphedema and said, well, what do you think? I think maybe we need a, a, you know, a, a global day for this, a global awareness day. And his response was, we don't need awareness, Bill. We need more than awareness. We need a cure. And I thought and got back to him and said, you're right. There's World AIDS Day. There's World Diabetes Day. What about World Lymphedema Day? And he said, yeah, that's it. Uh, we first, in New York State, I brought it to the New York State Assembly, and they passed a resolution creating World Lymphedema Day here in New York. But then I talked to Senator Schumer, who we had honored uh, uh, previously, and Senator Schumer took World Lymphedema Day resolution that I wrote uh, to the Senate floor uh, with a uh, resolution that was co-sponsored by uh, Senator Grassley and passed World Lymphedema Day. And it gave it that imprimatur worldwide of a day to celebrate. How does that translate now? I've been making videos for every country all over the world that is now doing this. The one that really excited me a couple of days ago is 23 organizations, lymphedema organizations in Europe have created a manifesto of their demands. They have now gone to the Swedish minister They've asked me to do a video for the Swedish minister about World Lymphedema Day, given the fact that Sweden is uh, president of the uh, uh, EU this year, so they can bring this message to the EU with their manifesto uh, for action in the uh, uh, EU community. Uh, this this is uh, you know expanding rather dramatically, and it's being fueled. Uh, by those people that now recognize their disease and recognize that they're not alone and seeing what other people are doing all around the world and finding their confidence, but they're also finding their voice to, de to demand the changes. At the same time that science is beginning to really catch up as well and be primed for it. So all these things needed to come together uh, at the same time. And I think, as I say, I, I don't think it's just coincidental that the CDC, NIH, Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program are all getting into the game at the same time, too. It's because of all the groundwork that's been done by so many people way before me, obviously. But I, I happen to get, you know, get to be here at the point where it's, uh, uh, it's actually all come together uh, in a very special way. At Vita Support MD, we believe in creating the best bioflavonoid-based supplements to support your vitality. Bioflavonoids are found in abundance in nature and support excellent health and wellness. The demands and stresses being put on our bodies in these challenging times are unlike any we have seen before. Support your body with the flavonoids it needs to fight inflammation and oxidation. Unlike other products in the marketplace, Vita Support MD dietary supplements use micronized flavonoids for optimal absorption and effectiveness. Micronization is an advanced process which creates an ultra fine powder easily absorbed by the body. At Vita Support MD, we are passionate about making your good health our life's work. Well, that's very exciting. And you know, this has been part of our, uh, our call at Vita Support MD behind our champion, Monica Glavitsky, who unfortunately could not be with us today, but um, Monica did 15 years of incredible research in uh, France for Serbia, uh, looking at uh, micronized purified flavonoid fraction and the effect that it has on the lymphatic system and increasing lymphatic flow, increasing lymphatic contractility, decreasing capillary permeability, et cetera. And we've been working six years to spread the word about what is produced as a dietary supplement here in the United States. Um, and every single day we meet with 
quote unquote experts in the field of venous and lymphatic medicine who have never heard of it. So we're all in this together uh, with compression, with um, MPFF, with the great work that you're doing, with more research, with more surgery. We've had surgeons on that Dr. Eicher and Dr. Moline have introduced us to, and on and on. One, one of the things that I wanted to touch on, um, Bill, having you here, because you have a very strong background in psychology, Jacqueline is now re retired from her, her role in clinical medicine and running the lab, and <clears throat> but has for years been very, very much interested in psychology and emotional issues, has studied psychology um, in college, and is involved in yoga and other forms of therapy. She has retreats, um, especially for women um, with various emotional and psychological um, challenges, um, and just in terms of uh, general uh, positive psychology and so forth. I wonder, and I, and I would love to see her continue in that vein with this group of patients particularly, because I think there's so much need and there's such a nexus and there's so much overlap. Maybe you could speak from your psychology background and encourage all of us, but particularly in this case, Jacqueline, to pursue the emotional and psychological aspect of this disease where we have the great, great physicians like Dr. Eicher working, of course, on the psychological and emotional aspect as well, but also largely on the physical aspect. Where do you think psychology and the emotional aspect and the mind plays in all of this and how can you encourage all of us and especially Jackie to to do more to do more for this incredible group of patients uh, that's a, a a big question there but I'll, I'll, I'll try and uh, narrow down um, you, it, interestingly one thing that I have found has happened uh, is we probably get more calls to the office now of people that are considering suicide or bodily harm than ever before. I don't think that's because more people are thinking it. I think it's because more people are feeling comfortable in coming forward with that. Uh, this has been one of those diseases, most diseases that you get, first of all, people know what the disease is generally, and I find people are extraordinarily compassionate when they understand something. And we happen to be a species which is extraordinarily cruel when we don't. So it's typical for me to get the calls from people saying, oh, I went out to uh, uh, lunch with some of my girlfriends. Uh, the maitre d' looked at my leg where a compression garment was on and said, I don't know what kind of a fashion statement you think you're making, uh, but that's inappropriate for our restaurant and you wouldn't seat us. So I left the I left the restaurant crying and running down the street. Uh, people that write to talk about how utterly abandoned they feel by dismissive doctors who try and make them feel like this disease just doesn't mean anything. Husbands writing saying, my wife has died now. I had no idea she suffered as much as she did. But she was routinely humiliated by her doctor for her complaining until he finally said, you must have dementia because of your complaints about your lymphedema. Oh. Sorry, I meant to plug in my... Um, you, you have a situation here where people are suffering terribly, but we've made to feel by not only society, but by their doctors themselves, that they have no right to feel the way they feel. So you've got this double-edged sword of feeling every aspect of your life has been diminished as a result of this disease and society who feels you have no right to feel that way, including those people who you respect that are the doctors whose words you take. So where does this end up leaving you psychologically? Uh, people routinely tell me, uh, women with breast cancer especially would say, I've stopped even trying to tell my family about the name of my disease. They never get it right. They keep saying that lymphoma thing you have, Ma, not so bad, stop complaining kind of thing. And again, because it just hasn't reached the, the, the public consciousness. People will very often say, oh, Bill, but you know what? You don't die from lymphedema. 
And my response is, yeah, the good news is you don't die from AIDS either. And they stare at me like, what are you, crazy? I said, well, you don't die from AIDS. You die from all the opportunistic infections that you get as a result of having the virus. It's the same thing with lymphedema. How many people do we know who have died because of cellulitis infections that antibiotics weren't able to come or because of the obesity or heart disease that's resulted as a result of it, and et cetera? But or even God besides forbid, that, God I think- forbid, uh, so I hate to interrupt, but or God forbid suicide, as you said, Bill. Yes, yes. So the whole idea, and I found, you know, it's interesting. We had our Gordon Research Conference in Italy uh, uh, last year, and uh, we did it through video this time. Uh, through Zoom, and there were five patients. Four of them brought up the same issue independently, and all of them with the same sense of, I really have no right to complain about this. Mm -hmm. And that was the idea of, I can't wear clothes. I can't find clothes. I look freakish. I'm embarrassed to go out to events as a result. But always saying, but of course, I have no right to say that. That's superficial, et cetera. Um, actually, this is a pretty major thing. Thinking that you look freakish and then having to put clothes on to make you even look worse than that. Uh, so in, for instance, one of the people that contacted us, uh, his one leg was many, many times larger than the other leg. So he could only wear very large sweatpants. So he refused to go to his child's graduation as a result. All right, he, got, he happened to meet me. I was able to send him to the Boston Lymphatic Center where Dr. Drup Singh Hall met with him. He's been on seven day a week treatment. He sent me his photograph and I also then connected up with the seamstress who made him his pants. He sent me a photo of him out dancing. Mm -hmm. It just shows what is actually possible and what is in these people's hearts. His leg was still big, he still has lymphedema, but for him, his life had been renewed from a person who had felt it's over and I'm not leaving the house ever again. I'm humiliated and I'm embarrassed. So anyway, as far as the psychological aspects, um, it's, it's a devastating disease, not only on a physical, but an emotional level and made more so because you don't get any support from the community at large. And especially from those people who should be in the front line of giving you that sympathy and empathy, your caretakers. Your therapist, you'll get it from. Doctors in general, unless you're getting a specialist in the field, but it's also why LEARN established centers of excellence in the diagnosis and treatment of lymphatic diseases. Uh, routinely, we were being told by different centers, oh, we're a center. Okay, we'd send a patient. I'd call the patient up and say, how'd your, how'd your appointment go? The response would be, oh, they called me on the phone, they interviewed me, and they canceled the appointment. They said I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a candidate for surgery. I thought, Kennedy for surgery? Who thought you were a candidate for surgery? That's a very small number of people that that's appropriate for. So we decided we really needed to set standards for various levels of treatment, but also so that anytime somebody went to a center, they knew they would be cared for or referred to a place where they would be cared for, and we could follow up with them. We now have 50 centers of excellence all around the world. We knew we were doing something right when groups like Johns Hopkins and the Cleveland Clinic and MD Anderson were calling up saying, how do we become a learned center of excellence? And then going through the very elaborate set of standards set up by uh, 18 international leaders, Emily Eicher being one, who creates the standards, constantly is reviewing and updating the standards, and then reviewing the institutions, each of which who has an affiliate board of both patients and people at the institution that keep us informed of whether they're living up to our expectations in that regard, and that's been a game changer. And as Emily said, I mean, from Taiwan to India, all of through Europe, et cetera, and throughout the United States, uh, Australia, et cetera, uh, we now have centers of excellence and it's growing uh, at a rather uh, rapid rate. So that, that's, a, that's a monumental change. Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000 from Vita Support MD are backed by science and sold in doctor's offices. If you're a physician who may be interested in prescribing or selling these excellent nutraceuticals, please call 862-246-7877 to speak to a representative today. We are the only centers that we undress patients. And frequently, 
the patients are uh, reporting that, you know, you're the first doctor who asked me to take my clothes off. My other doctors are just giving me prescription for lab tests and, and scans and so, but nobody undresses me. And so, especially the centers of excellence, and thank you, Bill, for setting up these centers of excellence all over the world. Now, the patients are getting better care. And also, not only, we are giving them hope. And frequent question is, uh, can you fix my leg, doctor? And, and I reply is no, but we can improve it. And as you point, pointed out, yes, patients can start wearing their old shoes back again when the feet are smaller and they can be more active and mobility is improving and the pain is being reduced and so on. And patients are grateful. This is one wonderful field of medicine where patients are so grateful once they improve and improve at least 10, 20%, it depends. Today I had a patient with 85 year old woman with swollen legs and she said, I had this for quite a few years. And when I did the ultrasound on her, yes, she has lymphedema. Now we need to find out why, but she will improve if she doesn't have any other diseases. But we are, as you pointed out, Bill, there is a hope. We don't have a pill to cure, but we have lymph formula, lymphatic formula that was put together and researched out by Dr. Monica Glovitsky. And now you can even buy it on Amazon and Dr. John Schubach is behind this. And the research shows, yes, you are improving when you take the lymphatic formula. And and patients report, I have less pain after this medication. So we need more research, but uh, we are on the right way to improve lymphatic function for all these lymphatic disorders. And one of the other things I want, I want to interject there, uh, which came up in a consultation with a patient today, and uh, Bill, feel free to jump in on this and uh, Emily, Jacqueline, anyone. Um, one of the problems I'm seeing again and again is that the disease, no matter what the underlying etiology, is often being neglected at early stages and allowing patients to progress through the stages and get quite severe. Once it gets severe enough that it gets anyone's attention, then it appears too severe to the clinician to do anything about it. So this is the slippery slope. And that's why I think intervention of all kinds, hands-on therapy, compression, uh, dietary supplementation, exercise, movement, again, something that Jacqueline uh, talked about on the last show, the idea of just the power of walking, the power of walking and hands-on therapy, et cetera, et cetera. It has to start early in early stages to prevent the progression and especially rapid and especially severe progression. So if anybody wants to pick up on that concept, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I, I will say, uh, uh, I obviously agree with you uh, completely there, John. Obviously, we know uh, lymphedema begins preclinically before the patient even necessarily begins to know that it's uh, uh, occurring. Uh, one thing that was uh, uh, an eye-opener and, and, and disconcerting, but sometimes disconcerting is good because it shows you exactly where you stand, and then you can focus on, aha, now I see what part of the problem is. And that is, uh, Kathy Bates and I presented at, at a conference a few years back. Um, surgeons in the room first said, uh, I don't know what you think you're doing here. We're surgeons. We've seen it all. Our eyes are just going to roll back in our head because we already know it. Good. Okay. Um, after talking about and encouraging uh, bioimpedance, uh, for instance, uh, measuring lymph flow before or after surgery, uh, determine if, in fact, uh, the, there's a discrepancy there, uh, the response was, I wouldn't use that device even if you gave it to me. It takes an extra five minutes. I don't have an extra five minutes in my day. 
Now you're you're standing there with your mouth open saying there's an opportunity to detect uh, any differentiating lymphatic flow where you could begin compression therapy, et cetera, uh, very early on be while it's preclinical to stop it from progressing. And you're giving me a lecture on, I wouldn't do anything at that point because my job is just to be a surgeon and I don't have any extra time to deal with this other issue. Um, I find the best way to change people's opinions. And when I worked in the field of developmental disabilities, it was the same thing. Uh, you need to make uh, uh, people feel uh, incompetent and immoral. And I would say my part of my job <laughs> is to make doctors who think that way and surgeons who think that way both incompetent and immoral. Now, it's hard when there are no treatments out there that they think they can deliver. But once there are, well, that's why I'm always hopeful for these you know, drug interventions of some sort, because one thing that physicians are very good at doing is, is writing prescriptions, knowing that they're the only ones that could do it. So if there's a prescription that could actually heal you, or that would be pretty immoral not to even know it exists for your patient population. Um, I, I think things would be able to change at that point. Um, at this point, we see uh, the, the, the physicians that are most likely to be interested in lymphatics at this point tend to be surgeons because of those surgeons who have found, but well, there are things we can do. We can do lymphatic venous anastomosis. We can do lymph node transfer, we can do liposuction, uh, debulking. All right, that's a narrow band of those people with lymphedema that that's gonna apply for. But they're excited because we've given them something to do and they're learning new things and that's exciting. Not too exciting if we don't give doctors anything that they feel that they can do um, and I think a lot of it rests with the patient population to become firm enough in their advocacy where they're going into their physicians and making it known their expectation of the knowledge level that they expect their doctors to have. Instead, I think you probably hear every day the same thing I have. Yep, I went to my doctor and afterwards he said, boy, I've learned so much from you about lymphatic disease and lymphedema. And their response is, I didn't come to you to teach you. I came to you for you to treat me. Uh, but very often, I think that's generally the case, where, where, where physicians are learning more from their patients than patients are learning from them. And then comes the point where they feel so demoralized. Just recently, I got a, an email uh, from a man saying, at this point, he was talking about his wife. At this point, we don't even expect any help from our doctor. If we could just get an ounce of dignity, that's all, just some dignity. So they're, they're not only not getting the help they need on a medical level, it's that issue of dignity that is being lost in the mix as well. Because in the process of translating, I don't know how to help you, rather than just owning up to it with a bit of humility, generally it's stop complaining, it's your fault. And that really gets to the heart of these people who don't expect miracles from their doctors, but are broken by the way they're made to feel is that they have no right to even feel bad about the disease they have. Yeah, and when you talk about morality and uh, ethics really amongst physicians and surgeons, um, uh, a surgeon obviously guilty, <laughs> guilty as charged, I, I understand both sides of, of the argument in, in the sense that people um, in practice who are busy, they're under tremendous pressure, they're under tremendous strain, the burnout levels, as you know, is massive amongst physicians and surgeons currently. But the reality is, and this is why the work that you're doing is so important. Now, this may, may not sound nice, but the reality is also that reimbursement is an important factor. If a physician is under tremendous stress from a financial point of view in the current in milieu that we have of decreasing reimbursement and increasing costs and increasing malpractice insurance and increasing liability and so on and so forth, that so many, and I would say the vast majority of physicians now are leaving private practice to go take jobs for uh, big corporate structures, hospitals, et cetera, the work that you're doing to find funding and to and to 
uh, bring forth awareness amongst politicians and insurers and Medicare, Medicaid services, et cetera, et cetera, will be will be fundamentally important because it's it's not feasible for physicians um, to practice with no reimbursement. So there's there in many cases may be, and Dr. Eicher can help us to understand, there may be even misconception that none of this is reimbursed, the treatment isn't reimbursed, the therapy isn't reimbursed. We had an incredible group and one of our early shows from Omni Therapy here in New Jersey. Um, uh, and, and, you know, one of their challenges is to do a great job with a the patient. They have to spend an hour with a patient with decongestive therapy and hands-on therapy and so forth, because they're really great at what they do. But when you look at the reimbursement in that time, it almost becomes impossible to practice. So this is another incredible hurdle um, and uh, a big problem. And I thank you again for the hard work you're doing. So uh, Emily and uh, Bill, maybe comment on that aspect of the subject. Well, if I take a, a few seconds, uh, this, this type of treatment is labor intensive and uh, the reimbursement, as you mentioned, John, is pathetic, you know, for for uh, special equipment of the pump treatment. I think Medicare reimburses something like $16.80 or so for half an hour of that. And one pump, if you want to purchase this, is about three, four thousand dollars. So uh, I compliment all the physicians and therapists who are in this field of lymphology and lymphatic uh, treatment facilities that they are so dedicated because it is very labor intensive and it is not being financially rewarded. So much easier to be dermatologist where you remove a little pimple and you, you may charge X amount of dollars which if you compare that to lymphedema treatment, you need to do at least 10 sessions like this to equal the same amount. So it is very challenging and one has to be creative, but today we know more than we did in the past. Patients are more educated and we are trying to teach the patients to be proactive and uh, continue with their self-care at home. As a patient, I have to tell you, lymphedema is a luxury a disease where you have to spend so much time to take care of your limb that is affected by lymphatic insufficiency. Massaging on daily basis at home, wrapping, doing compression sleeve, therapeutic exercises, and so on. Hopefully, the research will show in the future that we may have some pharmacology stepping in and helping us with lymphatic disorders research. We could have gone on forever. We'll have uh, Bill Rapici back, certainly. Um, and uh, we hope to work with him more closely in the future, both the LymphCast podcast to support, learn in every way that we possibly can. Uh, bring greater attention to his organization and to the good work that he's doing. And I can speak for myself and my partners at Vita Support MD that certainly we look forward to uh, working hand in hand with LEARN and raising awareness on all aspects of uh, lymphedema care. Um, and uh, I'm interested to learn more about, and I'm sure Jackie would also be interested to learn more about the this yearly walk that you were referring to uh, that Emily is involved in. And I uh, just want to thank Bill once again for joining us and for sharing so much good information and knowledge. Uh, sure. Uh, if I could just uh, uh, close with uh, one thing that might be of interest to the researchers uh, in your community. Uh, first, thanks for the shout out for the walk. Actually, we'll have our global virtual walk on April 22nd. Emily Eicher will be honored with a Leadership in Patient Advocacy Award at that time. So uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, but I would say that uh, there's a program, the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. Uh, it's with the Department of Defense. It has a $370 million research budget this year. The only way you could apply for that research 
is Congress has to put your disease on the list of diseases that are appropriate for the Department of Defense's research budget, which means you need to show some disproportionate level of people in the military who end up getting lymphedema. We've been lobbying for this for the last three years. Uh, certainly a big part of the case has been the burn pits in Afghanistan and Iraq, which have led to extreme cases of head and neck uh, uh, cancer, uh, which leads to lymphedema in about 75% of people, as well as other diseases. In any case, for the first time in history, we succeeded in not only getting lymphatic disease on the list, but also lymphedema. So for the first time ever, that $370 million in research money is now available to our researchers. We'll be having a webinar on February 28th by the director of the program uh, through LEARN, where researchers can learn more about that. You can also go to the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program website uh, to find out more about all the funding levels. But that's a huge amount of money that is available now to our researchers in, 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 in this area. So I would encourage that you uh, take a look uh, uh, at that. We would love to see as many research proposals in there as possible. And we also succeeded with the National Institutes of Health, which we've lobbied for several years, which are now starting a national commission on lymphatic diseases to determine the need for lymphatic research going forward. And as Emily well knows, we have a three-year grant with the Centers of Disease Control to do a cancer-related lymphedema campaign that features uh, Kathy Bates as well as uh, Steve Gutenberg, but also has a research element of it that we co-work with Stanford University on uh, to help develop a national indicator report for the very first time uh, with uh, uh, the, the CDC that gives facts and figures regarding national incidence and prevalence uh, of lymphedema. So a lot of great stuff uh, going on right now to move the agenda forward. And I, I can't thank you all enough for giving me the chance to talk on about all this uh, today. Thank you. You know, Dr. Chubak, I'm beginning to think uh, Bill never sleeps. That's how he gets all this done. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> he would have made a great soldier. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Well, we thank you again for uh, listening and or watching uh, LymphCast episode number 20. Let's go ahead and uh, thank our panel tonight from New York, uh, RVT. And I want you to tell us what that is in a moment. But Jacqueline Sasek, thank you for, for everything tonight. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Bill. That was just an amazing talk tonight. Thank you. And what is RVT? Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. It stands for Registered Vascular Technologist. All right. Very good. Uh, from California, Dr. Emily Eicher. Thank you for everything tonight, uh, Dr. Eicher. Well, fantastic team. And uh, hopefully we will repeat this again because as it was pointed out, we need at least one more day to continue and continue and continue. This was a great show. Thank you. All right, and Dr. Eicher, would you take the honors of uh, officially uh, thanking Bill tonight for all of his uh, help and participation? Bill, my big thank you. You are incredible, awesome, and uh, get some sleep sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the founder of this show, uh, the LymphCast show, also the founder of Vita Support MD, makers of Vein Formula 1000, Lymphatic Formula 1000, physician surgeon from New Jersey, Dr. John A. Chubak. Hey, Dr. Chubak, thank you for everything, sir. Thanks, Paul. Always a pleasure. Look forward to the next one. All right. Thank you again for listening and or watching to LymphCast episode 20. We'll see you next time for episode 21. Have a great night.